Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are in the country. This is Ron Mintz from Vanguard. It's my great pleasure to introduce Fiona Ma, the treasurer of the state of California, to address us today on what's going on in California and specifically the state's initiatives with respect to the issuance of green bonds. Before we get started, though, the treasurer has asked that I remind members that of the following. The treasurer's comments today are intended to be general in nature and should not be understood to convey information that is not generally available in the public domain. The comments are intended to offer her personal views on general matters that you have posed and other observations and do not necessarily reflect the official views of the state. Since the legislature will be finalizing the state's fiscal 21-22 budget over the next several weeks, members should remain vigilant about developments that might arise during that process. An excellent resource for these developments is the Legislative Analyst website at www.lao.ca.gov. And with that, uh, Fiona, welcome, welcome to the NFMA Annual Conference. Um, we're so pleased that you could join us. Um, it's great to see you on the screen. We wish we could have seen you in Orlando, but welcome anyway. And let's just jump right into the conversation. Um, okay. I understand that green bonds are, a, are part of your finance strategy for the state of California. Can you talk to us about what you'd like to do? Yeah, so we would like to see more green bonds issued. And I know that investors are looking for uh, green investments, investments that are going to have a social impact and help uh, climate change. And so here in California, we um, organized a green bond market development committee. Uh, so co-hosted by the Goldman Institute at UC Berkeley. And we've got about two dozen professionals, uh, diverse individuals um, that are part of this committee to set some sort of standard for green bonds. Because right now, when you issue some, or you label something a green bond, people may ask, well, what is the definition of a green bond? So that's what we're attempting to do here in California. Uh, Pre-pandemic, we were on a roll uh, to get these standards rolled out, but uh, the pandemic has slowed us down. So hopefully by this fall, we will uh, come up with some sort of uh, definitive standard so that when California issues bonds labeled green, investors will be able to understand what goes into that definition. Um, Fiona, I know that you're an accountant by background. So um, can you tell me what differences are you expecting in pricing for something that has the green designation rather than you know just a plain old regular bond? Yeah, so that's always uh, that's always the discussion, right? Are investors willing to pay for something? Uh, are they willing to pay for something more? And I would say that yes, uh, certain investors, consumers, for example, like through the organic food movement, right? That was a whole big thing that organic products cost more and were consumers willing to pay more for those foods. But as people are getting more sophisticated and with the internet and be, being able to Google, uh, you know, um, everything under the sun, in, uh, consumers are willing to pay more for organic products. Similarly, we believe that investors, certain investors are gonna be and are willing to pay more for uh, green investments, but, what is green? And so that's what we also, as a society, have to decide whether we can break down some of these projects earlier and label them green instead of after the project comes to uh, you know, fruition, then what determines green? Some of it, all of it, a portion of it. So we are also looking at whether we can uh, label green uh, projects earlier in the process versus at the very end. So that's it's a complicated, uh, you know, complicated endeavor, but we are seeking uh, to do all of that, not only the labeling, but also the, uh, the tagging earlier on for projects that could be considered green. Do you, do you expect that um, this committee that you were talking about out of UC Berkeley, will they um, be the an entity that will eventually, will this committee eventually be an entity that will designate the bonds green? Or do you think you would leave that to a private sector entity, you know, like a, a shop that would pop up and apply principles that this committee or other, other groups come up with? Or do you think you would just leave it, like we're, we the state are designating this green and we'll leave it up to the investors to determine whether they agree with that or not? 
Um, I, we haven't really talked about this yet, but I would assume that the state, uh, we put in the time and the effort, uh, we're leaders on so many other um, you know, levels in terms of climate. I believe that the state would determine that this is and you know, we will sell that to investors and make sure we uh, disclose it properly. Okay, good. We'll look forward to that. Um, apart from bonding, though, um, you know, what, what are the, you know, California does have climate change uh, potential and the challenges associated with that. Who is going to, you know, what's needed in your view, who pays for it and how would it be financed other than through, you know, the, other than through bonding? Um, are you talking about uh, like fire mitigation or? What? Yeah, like other other climate change challenges. I mean, you know, in terms of you know the, the the projects that would get financed through bonds, but is one way. But there's it would seem to me that there's other challenges, um, other things that would be necessary to address climate change in California, particularly in the coastal areas, but also in the areas that are more fire prone um, that might not necessarily be conducive to bond financing. So how would you see those elements um, being financed and who would pay for that? Yeah, so um, the governor is uh, you know, releasing his May 15th budget tomorrow and he's been giving teasers all this week. Um, today, I heard him this morning at the Cal Chamber uh, breakfast uh, where he has announced a $75 billion surplus and climate uh, change is definitely one of his top priorities. Uh, we are going to see uh, whether he is going to fund the catalyst uh, climate bond that he was talking about in the last fiscal year pre-pandemic. Uh, we also had a wildfire, California wildfire uh, fund that was um, that was put into place. And so California is we're doing the best we can uh, to fund and to finance and to prepare. Uh, for the next natural disaster. So it's a combination, it's not one or the other, it's really a holistic approach to how we are trying to tackle these challenges that we are facing. Um, you know, you, you mentioned about the fires, but um, can you just talk for a moment about what the fiscal impact on the state has been from the fires, not just from the additional resources that Cal Fire might need, but also from lost revenues as um, uh, you know communities had to stop whatever economic activity was going on and rebuild or uh, figure out what they were gonna do? Yeah, um, obviously we can never uh, predict when a fire is gonna happen. My husband is a Ventura County firefighter and has been on you know, five of the last six major largest fires in California over the past few years. Um, in the Paradise Fires 2017 to 2018, we lost 84 individuals. So not only is there economic loss, but there is also human loss and the rebuilding takes a long time. Thankfully, we have help from the federal government. Congressman Mike Thompson last year allocated $100 million over the next 10 years to rebuild more housing in those fire devastated areas in 2017 and 2018. Uh, Congress has re-upped their commitment and are providing $88 million this year for 22 counties that were impacted by fires in uh, 2019 and 2020. So we have um, assistance from the federal government. Uh, we also, like I said, um, the governor's been putting a lot more money into uh, fire mitigation, resiliency efforts. Uh, I know that all of the utility companies are also um, doing their best to harden their lines. Uh, we went and visited uh, with Southern California Edison down at the Tehachapi's uh, over spring break and they are putting in new uh, telephone and electric poles um, from the wood, traditional wood ones to more fire resistant ones. And also, you know, making sure that the wires are covered and uh, infrastructure is, you know, being hardened. So everyone is doing uh, our best. Uh, we are uh, in another drought situation again. And so all hands on deck, everybody is you know, mobilizing and doing their part, um, as well as, you know, residents, you know, trying to conserve water um, is, is what we have to do as consumers. So we're all doing what we can. Um, let's cross our fingers and hope that nature is good to us this summer. 
Um, let me just say on a personal note, Fiona, I didn't know that your husband was a firefighter and that, uh, you know, kind of on behalf of the whole Muni community and uh, we, you know, as we come into this year's fire season, we hope it'll be a mild one and we'll wish him the very best and his colleagues the very best um, as they go into the season. So, and thank him for his service in this important area for the state. Um, there, there was, um, I, we were talking before, you mentioned that there's a multi-agency steering committee for climate related disclosures, different than the green bond designation. And I was wondering if you could discuss that and maybe also discuss what you think investors need um, of, in terms of climate disclosure that gives us the information that we need, but doesn't have you violating securities laws at the mm -hmm. same time. Yeah, so um, there is a multi-agency climate risk advisory group uh, that has been meeting. Uh, they are supposed to issue a final report to the governor this fall of 2021. And it's, around, it's based on you know, two areas, uh, basically physical risks arising from chronic or acute events. And the second is transaction related risks like changes in tax and investments or even technology like uh, AI, which is uh, becoming more and more prominent uh, today. So that group is, is working uh, collaboratively. It is different than our green bonds market development committee, but working hand in hand. And I think uh, the two together uh, will propel California and give investors uh, you know, more confidence. Obviously, disclosures uh, to investors have to be consist have to consist of real data and measurable consequences. Uh, and so that is what I think the two groups collaboratively will be um, will be um, coming to some conclusions, resolutions, uh, uh, recommendations, and of course the disclosures have to follow. Can you talk about what the um, uh, what the state plans to do with the federal monies that will be coming from um, uh, you know the re the recent um, uh, recovery plan, or is that something that is over the line given where we are in the uh, in the budget process? Yeah, so stay tuned tomorrow. I think the government <laughs> outlining um, where he would like to allocate all of the surplus as well as the uh, funds from the federal government. Uh, we are expecting $26 billion to the state of California uh, for all sorts of COVID re related uh, relief programs, but I don't have, I'm not privy to the information at this moment. So uh, you'll all have to wait till tomorrow. Okay. Um, there's also talk in Washington about um, another round of, of funding for infrastructure. And um, I was curious if you have any thoughts yet or, or, or any insight as to what you know what you might be able to expect and how it would interact with state spend? Yeah, I, I, I don't think um, I um, I know what's going to happen with the infrastructure uh, funding. I know that they are talking about it, which is great because we have had a lot of deferred maintenance, uh, big projects that we really could use uh, infrastructure for, as well as for housing. You know, we have a housing crisis here in California and many single family homes um, that have been permitted are not able to be built uh, due to the great recession. Many of the local governments are not able to provide the infrastructure costs for below the ground, above the ground, and we could really use more infrastructure to the so we are putting together a list. I have Tim Schaefer putting together like the top five wish lists that we would like to see here in California. Um, and so stay tuned for that. But we are actively engaged uh, with the federal government through the National Association of State Treasurers, but also through my office, uh, written about 80 different letters to Congress, uh, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury, you know, providing suggestions, recommendations, guidance, you know, needs, who could use the money. And I know that uh, all those uh, agencies, entities are really listening and it's very, very helpful when they get more input than less. So keep those letters coming and, and feedback. Um, if you all have certain projects or <clears throat> priorities that you would like to see funded. Um, Fiona, given your instincts as a, as a politician and also conversations that you may have had with uh, the state's congressional representatives and through um, uh, the State Treasurer's Association, do you think that 
like, is it your instinct that something actually will come out of Congress with respect to infrastructure or are things just hopelessly deadlocked in Washington and there'll be a lot of talk, but nothing really will come out of it at the end of the day? No, I, I definitely think something is gonna come out. Um, I think we all know that there are a lot of infrastructure needs. Uh, it would help stimulate the economy. It would help create jobs. And that's what we really need right now. Uh, some people have done well through the pandemic, mostly through stock sales, uh, but others have really been suffering. And to be able to create jobs uh, through these stimulus monies are gonna be very, very important. I know California is, um, is looking forward to as much infrastructure money as we can. Uh, we have a California iBank uh, that is you know, doing its share of providing needed funding for local governments, but also local governments also issue their own bonds, right? But there's still a lot of need. I know in the housing space, for example, um, SIDLAC, we, I oversee the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee that allocates the private activity, tax exempt bonds. Our needs just in housing is three times more than our bond count right now. And that does not include other projects like wastewater, um, you know, water treatment, desal, garbage, and recycling. I mean, we have probably another $3 billion worth of bond cap needs over there. So infrastructure money would be very helpful in alleviating some of these uh, projects that would apply for bonds. Um, would you be supportive of a federal infrastructure? You talked about the Cal Bank. Would you, would you be supportive of a federal infrastructure bank? Um, I am not... Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I just know that our iBank is working in California, and to the extent that the federal government can create another resource uh, that states are not able to tap into, then I'm all for any type of assistance the federal government can give to us. <laughs> Do you have any insights yet as to how, um, or thoughts as to how it should be levered? Like, is there gonna be a maintenance of effort requirement or a matching requirement? Or are you expecting that projects that reach to a, a national impact level would just be find funding from federal sources without any state matching requirements? I, I have no idea. You're probably more uh, knowledgeable <laughs> these ideas than, than I am. I have no idea. I think everybody is giving their input to the Fed. Uh, and so those ideas that rise to the top are probably uh, what's going to come out in terms of guidelines. Fair enough. Are you so? Are you supportive of, of BABS 2.0? Um, like I said, uh, the BABS program under the Obama administration in 2009, it was only a short-term uh, program, but it did provide resources for capital projects, new capital projects uh, for municipalities. Um, California, we received $5.2 billion that we were able to use, and it did create economic stimulus, it created jobs, and so, yes, I would be supportive of um, a similar program like that. California would use it, trust me. It seemed like on the state level um, that the um, there was a great demand for the state's bonds as well. Yes, yes. Our, our bonds have been oversubscribed uh, this year, especially, uh, sometimes three times oversubscribed. So people are looking for safe places to invest. And I think California is still uh, the golden state. People have confidence in our state. We are roaring back, as the governor uh, said earlier in his speech today, uh, as soon as we can open post June 15th, I think uh, we will see more economic activity. California is made of entrepreneurs. We are diverse. We want to work. We want to succeed. Uh, and so, um, you know, I can't wait till June 15th, personally. <laughs> I should have a follow-up on that, but let me just finish up with the, with the BAPS thought that I, that I have first. Um, one of the issues that came out of, of BAPS that we didn't necessarily think about in the 1.0 version was that if there was a period of sequestration, the BAP payments were delayed, um, which caused issues for the state that was expecting the cash flows, but it also created some inconsistencies into how coverage was determined as to whether the full amount or just the amount actually received was counted. So with that in mind, um, as a state treasurer, what would, would you, um, if there is a BABS 2.0 that comes out, would you be, you know, what kind of advice would you give to 
of the federal the Fed, the federal treasury department that would be administering it, I guess, as to how it can be, how these issues that came out earlier could be addressed. Yeah, I mean, we learned from the past and, you know, that sequestration uh, issue uh, did impact the states and we don't want that to happen again. And so I think a lot of folks who uh, were involved in the 2009 BATS program are going to come out and recommend or at least let this administration know that we um, liked certain things and we didn't like certain things. Um, even during some of these stimulus rounds, they the federal government was very generous to the state of California and locals, but because of some clause that was in there, we weren't able to use it. And we did try to let the government know after that, you know, thank you very much, but it creates a liability on the states if the locals are using it and we tried to get it changed but i don't think they changed it and so we weren't able to really utilize that type that money here in the state but i know that the federal government has been flexible to the extent that a program is not working uh, they do listen to the constituents and the states and the municipalities and will tweak it if need be to make sure that we can all better use the funds. So sometimes things are written in the guide, guidelines and it doesn't work and we all lobby and they do change it and then you know we're able to utilize it. So we'll see what happens if there's a new FAB 2.0 program. Okay, let me let me go back to the California you know, is coming back statement, which I'm, I'm glad to hear and hoping that that will be the case. But um, there's a lot of press and a lot of articles and a lot of chatter and, and different podcasts and elsewhere about the exodus of, from California, whether it's by corporations, whether it's by the middle class, the wealthy. Um, is this just clickbait or is it overstated or what's your what's your view on that? Um, well, there's always people that are going to leave the state and there's always people gonna, uh, that are going to come to the state. Uh, and over the last you know 20 years, it's always been about net neutral for those that leave there are more people coming back. I think this year in the census, we have lost a little bit of population. So we're gonna be losing one congressional seat. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I think we saw a lot of companies that were able to keep their employees working from home. Those are the companies that said, why do we need to have fancy office buildings, expensive costs? Uh, right, when people are in the office, mostly tech companies, when we can have everybody work at home. And therefore, people can choose where they want to live. Sometimes the taxes, I'm a tax accountant, so I know that companies and people are sensitive to taxes. Um, you know, once their kids grow up, for example, and are out of school, then those people may choose to move outside of the state for different reasons. But usually when families are here, their kids are in school, they want to stay here. And then once the kids, you know, finish and go to college is when uh, certain people make that decision to leave the state. But I think during the pandemic, uh, lots of tech companies that we've heard of have decided to move outside of the state. But post-pandemic, I don't know. I think California is a great place to live. Most of us are willing to pay a little bit of a sunshine tax and... Summers are brutal in some of these states, and maybe some of them will start coming back once we start opening up, going back to a, you know, uh, the, whatever the new normal is. Um, what changes in taxation regulation or the business environment are warranted, if, if anything? Uh, well, the governor today was talking about uh, film tax credits as one example, and I have a, a bill that I'm sponsoring um, or of diversity film tax credits to try to bring more filming back from Georgia, for example. Uh, Tyler Perry opened up a studio. Uh, the state of Georgia had a very, very aggressive tax credit program that really changed where a lot of filming has been going in the last you know, decade or so. And so glad to hear that the governor said today that he's gonna put more money into a film tax credit to get more uh, filming back to the state of California. Tax incentives, tax credits uh, do work. We need to be competitive with other states, but we also have to be mindful that we in California have to address certain uh, quality of life needs, 
Um, we need to make sure we're building more housing across the spectrum. Um, and so it's just a combination of everything. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a temporary thing. And these companies will come back because of our ingenuity, our entrepreneurship, the amount of universities and qualified people that we graduate. I think they will be there. Have your, have your views on that subject changed since the, like if we were having this conversation 18 months ago, would you have perhaps felt differently about uh, the California regulatory environment or the um, uh, business environment in the state compared to now that we've had the pandemic for uh, more than a year now? Uh, I personally have always uh, been cognizant and aware that we need to compete better against our other states and our other countries. When I was in the legislature, I was very active with all of the statewide uh, associations of elected officials, and they would always, you know, brag that people were coming here or that they, you know, we had, um, you know, certain industries that were growing because of tax incentives or, or easier regulations. And so I'm very cognizant that we need to stay competitive. And I'm glad that in this environment, the governor is putting more money into our Cal Competes program. And that's helping uh, companies, encourage them to stay and grow and, and hire a certain amount of full-time employees in certain industries. So he's doubled that investment. He's put more money into our sales tax exemption program under my office, where companies who are buying expensive equipment to green and clean the environment can apply for a sales tax waiver. And that could be upwards of 10% of the cost of the equipment. And it makes a difference. It does make a difference when companies are trying to figure out uh, where to locate and where to grow. So the governor is also uh, very cognizant that we need to better compete. Uh, Fiona, there's been a couple of questions that have come in from uh, people listening to our discussion. So let me pose a couple of those. Um, one is to stating that you're a big advocate for the Cal Savers program. Is that let me just fact check that. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. It was, okay. Uh, it was so the question, the question this person is asking is, how impactful has it been and will it make a difference in closing the wealth gap? Yes. Okay. So uh, Cal Savers was authored by Kevin DeLeon and also sponsored by my predecessor, John Chung. So I do want to give them credit because it took six years for that program, uh, for them to stand up that program. Uh, since then, uh, we are now on our second deadline. Our first deadline was employers who employ over 500 employees. Their deadline was last September. And this June uh, is a deadline for anyone who employs um, uh, fifth, uh, up to uh, 100 employees. I'm sorry. First one was 100 or more. And this one is uh, from five employees to 100 employees. So that deadline is going to be uh, this June 30th, 2021 to sign up their employees. So basically what we're trying to do is create a post, uh, you know, a, a Roth type IRA program for any employer who does not offer a retirement savings plan for their employees, they will have to enroll their employees into our Cal Savers program. We estimate there are about seven to 8 million workers who don't have a retirement savings plan. So. The concept is you enroll them, you have an automatic deduction uh, from the person's paycheck, they don't see it, it goes into a savings account and it will sit there, hopefully for retirement, but if not, then, uh, you know, then if they need it for some emergency, they don't have to go out and get, you know, high interest, you know, credit cards or, or other uh, type of, um, you know, loans, but that they will able be able to self-sustain and not go into further debt. So it's working. Uh, we have a lot of successes and you can log on to our website at www.calsavers.com. And we, um, you know, this program is working and we just won uh, the lawsuit. Um, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayer Association filed a lawsuit and it's taken about two years, but we succeeded now in courts again and we are moving ahead. Other states also adopted Cal Savers programs and it's just really a great opportunity to make sure that people are saving uh, for retirement or for a rainy day, so to speak. 
Um, another question that came in is whether the state is expecting a huge tax windfall this year, um, either just because the stock market has been on such a tear or because investors may sell in anticipation of a future higher cap gains tax. Yeah, uh, so 90% uh, of our general fund is dependent on personal income tax, sales tax, and corporate income tax. And this past year, we have seen um, an uptick in personal income tax, mostly due to capital gains. Uh, so yes, we do see that um, a lot of the uh, net surplus operating uh, revenues have come from capital gains and stock options and bonuses because companies are still going IPO. Uh, and this week or Monday is our tax day, uh, May 15th. So we will get a better indication, a better picture after, after next week. Okay. Um, I was curious if you had any comments about the uh, gubernatorial recall, either politically or fiscally. Yeah, so this recall is gonna cost estimated $100 million to run a special election when the governor is up for re-election next year. To me, it is a waste of money and it is a in terms of all the things that we should be focused on, right? The pandemic and wildfires and, and drought. And so to me, it's a waste, huge waste of money. That's a waste of money and time and a distraction. I wanted to, um, you know, go a little bit more um, personal because we've been talking a lot about um, uh, diversity, inclusion, um, equity, um, and both as a country and as an industry. In fact, there's going to be a panel on that very subject a little bit later this afternoon, which I highly recommend everybody. And, you know, to get personal myself, I, I grew up in California. Um, there were lots of Asian kids in my, in my school. Um, and among our family friends. And, you know, I, it would be hard for me to set, to have imagined that there was an awful lot of um, discrimination in those 60s and 70s when I was growing up. So we're not talking about, you know, the, the war years, but I'm a Caucasian male. Like, so, you know, my experience doesn't probably, or, you know, my experience probably doesn't mean a whole lot. And I was just curious in light of the events earlier this year in Atlanta, um, if your perspective, is different um, as an Asian woman, somebody who's younger than I am and you know, grew up in a different time maybe than I did. Um, and if there's experiences that you've had or been made aware of either in California or nationwide that would, um, you know, that we should all be, you know, as a society as a whole should be aware of. Yeah, I mean, as you can see this last year, uh, racism has really risen uh, to the top. Um, it starts, I think leadership starts at the top. Um, you know, having someone that invokes this type of, you know, hatred or racism or targeting um, is just not healthy. And we are trying to rebuild, uh, rebuild that trust. In California, we are extremely diverse as, as you all know, we're 40 million people. Uh, many are immigrants or daughters and sons of immigrants like myself. And it is very uh, disheartening uh, to see any community targeted. Right now, there are people that are just attacking our Asian seniors as they are on the bus or you know, shopping in their neighborhoods, um, sometimes trying to rob them, but just sometimes just trying to push them down. Like, where have we come as a society where younger people are actually knocking older people down? Um, so it is just really, really distressing, and I um, thank the community for standing up and supporting our community during this time. Is there? Do you think it's different in California than it is in other parts of the of the country, or is California, um, you know, equally uh, been as equally impacted since whether the pan you know, the pandemic came out or even before that? I think it's probably worse outside of California. Um, I've traveled a lot uh, to different states um, and it's just shocking in California uh, to see this happening, right? Um, but I'm sure it's happening worse in, in other states just because there's less 
uh, left people, left people that look like you, and therefore, uh, you know, the Asian community is maybe lumped into one uh, monolithic community, um, which, you know, impacts every single a API uh, outside of, of the U.S. But it's just, it's just sad that we should be targeting anyone in this world. We should be really focused on the problems at hand, uh, supporting each other, helping each other, because ultimately if you um, go back to the basics, what do we all want, right? We all wanna get a good college education, we wanna get a good job, we wanna raise a family, and then you wanna retire in dignity. That's pretty much what everyone wants. And so why can't we just focus on making sure that we are all accomplishing uh, our, our goals, you know, the American dream, instead of trying to, you know, hurt each other. I really appreciate your thoughts on that. And I think it's sad that we have to have the conversation in the first place, but um, it seems to be, um, you know, happening more and more, um, you know, to my, to my shock, I have to say. Um, part of your, um, you're, you're part of the um, tax credit and the private activity bond debt allocation committees. And you talked about housing being, you know, the, the top priority for, the, for those, but are there other priorities that you're looking at in terms of, you know, whether it's environmentally um, uh, positive projects that need to be financed with volume cap allocation or uh, whether it's, D, you mentioned desal, like what are, what are the priorities that your committees would have for either allocating tax credits, um, other than, I guess most of those go to housing, but, you know, to other areas where they can be or to um, volume cap uh, bond allocations? Yeah, so I chair uh, both TCAC and SIDLAC, the Tax Credit Allocation Committee and the uh, Debt Allocation uh, Committee. So we have a housing crisis here in California due to a number of reasons. Uh, the dissolution of redevelopment agencies back in 2012 uh, used to allocate a billion dollars uh, for affordable housing and just the uh, difficulty in permitting right? Uh, certain communities don't want certain housing. Local governments have a role as well. Uh, we have something called CEQA um, that is also invoked. And so building housing or building anything in California is a lot slower than in other states because we have regulations, we have higher standards, which I think is good and bad, right? It's good because, uh, you know, 30 years ago, we had smog all over California. And now you come to California and it's sunny every day, but that took 30 years of work. So because we have a housing crisis, uh, this governor, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom and I got elected two plus years ago, housing is his priority. Uh, he allocated 500 million uh, in state low income housing tax credits to uh, our committees. This will be the third year now in this budget. And those 4% tax credits have to be matched with the bonds. And for the first time in decades, our bonds have been competitive. And because we have a housing crisis and he wants new construction units, we have pretty much put 99% of our, our bond cap into new construction units. So out of the $4.3 billion, um, only 600 million is going for other projects. That's not a lot. And so that's where we get back to, there are wastewater projects, you know, detail, garbage and recycling, um, all these other uh, worthy projects that will help clean and green our environment uh, desperately needs uh, bonds as well. So that's the conundrum. If we could increase our bond cap uh, from the federal government, that would alleviate some of the pressure and allow us to fund some of these other projects. Uh, if we are able to reduce the cap from 50% to 25% in terms of the bonds, that would also stretch the bonds out a little bit more. Uh, we are also um, using a synthetic 4% in allocating these last disaster credits um, that are coming right now to also try to expand. So we're trying to do whatever we can. Oh, and then bond recycling. We're also embarking on bond recycling um, with private sector companies like you know, Apple is providing a billion dollar credit facility 
uh, to our Cal HFA to allow us to um, recycle some of the bonds. So we're doing everything we can here in California. Uh, we need more. We need more bonds and we need more bond cap. So we are lobbying the federal government really, really hard on this issue. Well, there seems to be an insatiable demand in the market for California paper at the moment. So if there's a way to get that, uh, you know, you'll probably be able to get those bonds sold pretty easily at the moment. Um, Absolutely. Which actually leads to a question that, that came in. Um, just kind of a clarification, we were talking about the green bond issues before um, that, um, you know, clarification of the understanding that you think that some investors would be willing to accept um, lower returns for what, what this, the person who posed the question was calling brown bonds, which I find funny in light of the, the former governor, but, uh, um, you know, would accept uh, lower, lower returns for green bonds compared to uh, so-called brown bonds? I mean, I mean, I'm not sure what we're talking about lower returns, but we're talking about targeted uh, investments, right? Where do you want to put your money? And I don't think if green bonds are going to generate lower returns, that's not necessarily going to help uh, the green bond market. So green bonds, they have to be uh, green, they have to be uh, defined, and they have to go to projects that I think investors want to see done, right? Water, uh, water projects, for example, um, is important. And, you know, I think investors, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean lower um, yields, but it's just going to mean different priorities and options for investors. Fair enough. Uh, one of the comments that came in, um, maybe it's from an investor who's not quite as happy, wants to know if, there, if there's any hope of getting the states audit out a little bit more quickly. I know that's not, that's not the treasurer's responsibility, but as an, it was posed to you as an accountant. It, yes, um, it, it is not under uh, my jurisdiction, but we have been embarking on a new fiscal uh, accounting system to try to get uh, the different uh, fiscal, agencies in line and any type of IT project um, takes a long time. And in this case, it's taken longer than expected. So um, again, we are doing our best to, to get these uh, statements out as soon as possible. Okay, I'm sure we all appreciate that. Um, I was curious about the, um, uh, the school funding. Are you expecting it? Um, as we come out of the pandemic, are you expecting it to continue to be delayed um, in terms of how it's allocated each month and is delayed over the, the past year or so? Or, or are you expecting that as we get back to a more you know, normal situation that the um, cash flows for the school districts will also become more normal? Yeah. Uh, again, stay tuned for tomorrow. <laughs> I know that the governor is uh, there. Uh, very concerned about education and education funding, and there were a lot of deferrals and trigger cuts in last year's budget. And so I am hoping, like all of you, that we are going to uh, see a lot of those uh, reversed uh, in this budget due to our operating surplus. Um, besides the, uh, the, the changes in cash flows to the school district, has there been any, any other fiscal impacts to the state of COVID? Um, both in terms of you know, where the increased costs have been, decreases in revenues offset by you know, perhaps uh, you know, the stock market um, uh, related cap gains revenues. Is there any, uh, have you guys started to anal analyze yet where the, uh, what the total impact of the pandemic has been? Um, I have not personally, but stay tuned. The legislative uh, analyst office is the one that uh, produces all of those reports. And so I think after the budget comes out, we will see a full report in terms of, you know, the impact and where the money is projected or uh, proposed to go in this new fiscal year budget. Is there, um, there was a question that came in going back to the um, disclosure on the green bonds as to have you, do you have an idea yet as to what you would like to see in terms of that disclosure, are you going to wait for the uh, uh, the committee's reports to come out, and as well as uh, suggestions from the NFMA, which has a um, a task force on this for recommended best practices? I understand GFOA does as well. Do you have any insights as to what you'd like to see? Uh, I do not. 
I do not. I, I leave it to the experts to produce their uh, reports and their studies, and then we will go from there uh, in terms of what will actually be uh, in the disclosures. But you know, my team at the treasurer's office is very, very experienced um, in, in selling bonds and putting together the disclosure statements, as well as the governor's office of finance and the state controller's office. So uh, it will be very, very thoughtful and robust, I'm sure. Um, one thing that, that, you know, that I and, and my colleagues at Vanguard really appreciate, um, and I'm sure that other people on the buy side do as well, is how proactive you and your predecessors have been to coming out to um, either whether it's New York or coming even, you know, to see us directly. Um, but we've been doing, you know, things on Zoom for the past year, uh, get more than that now. Do you think that that kind of uh, direct investor outreach and um, that kind of travel for uh, you know, bond, you know, bond roaches is going to be a thing of the past, or do you think that um, that that sort of interaction is actually better in person and is a um, something that you'll look to take up again once um, it's safe to do so? I think it's um, it's always best to go and meet in person and look at each other eye to eye, be able to read body language. And when I came to visit you all, I think there was like fifty people in the room. Uh, that was one of my first uh, meetings, and it was extremely intimidating, but I figured, let's just go, <laughs> introduce myself. I didn't know anything, uh, or as much as I, I do, you know, two plus years later, uh, but I think that sets the tone in being open and responsive and also, you know, wanting to work collaboratively, you know, with you and, and you know, all of our investors uh, and stakeholders. I think it's important that elected officials get out there in person, go see and hear and touch and feel the community. So I think it's important and I will continue to do that. Well, I, I, I hope we didn't intimidate you. I don't think anybody intended to, uh, for that to be the case, but I think it just, you know, I think the, the large um, interest really reflects how important the state of California's bonds, you know, you come, several times a year, you have a lot of debt outstanding. Many people on the buy side, particularly on the mutual fund side, have Cal, you know, dedicated California funds. Those are obviously yep. a big part of that. So we all care about you, whether, <laughs> and so we'll try to not be so intimidating, but we do care. Well, that's okay. I mean, I just didn't expect so many people. Normally it's, you know, like a couple of, you know, a dozen at, at most. And so the fact that there were so many people there actually impressed me that people, <laughs> are really focused on California and we really appreciate that. Uh, we are indeed. Um, we've got just a few minutes left. Um, do you, um, any, what are your, any final thoughts that you wanted to uh, um, communicate to this, uh, you know, this mini analyst slash investor base that uh, of a couple hundred people we have here? Uh, I, I, I think it's been a great working relationship. Um, we're always appreciative in our office uh, of feedback and meetings, and we hope post-pandemic that we will continue to have an open dialogue and in-person meetings. I do think it is, but uh, I think these Zoom calls are also a great way to involve more people. Uh, I've done about 200 webinars over the last year. I wouldn't have necessarily been able to go to 200 uh, different events. Uh, and this has really opened up, I think, uh, you know, democracy, it's open transparency and accountability. And I think that we will have some combination of in-person and also virtual, because I think there is, uh, it, there is, um, you know, serve the purpose uh, and it allows more people uh, to engage. So I, I'm, I think that's the silver lining out of this pandemic. Great. Well, with that, let me just say thank you so much again for making time for the NFMA. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, I thought it was a good discussion. I hope everybody else did as well. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, uh, let me just say thanks again. And uh, we appreciate all your, all your help and all your support. Thank you, Ron. Look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thanks.